<laughs> oh, I feel stirred up and excited already. Well, welcome back. Hey, praise the Lord. Well, we just open our hearts to you, Lord. We want you to teach us and to help us as we learn about how to work with you, work with the Spirit of God, work in deliverance, work in ministry. Lord, we want to be sons and daughters that honor you, that we build with you. Lord, we give you thanks. Amen. Amen. Do you realize the word for son in the Bible means to be a builder of the Father's house? So when we think of sonship, uh, you need to understand then sonship then has something different in the thinking of it in the Bible and the Hebrew culture to what we would understand it. A son extended the father's business. A son represented the father. A son was the extension of the father. And so that's why when Adam was uh, put in the garden, he was put in as a son and a carrying the DNA of his father to extend his father's kingdom. So his sin was immense disloyalty and dishonor to his father. And so in order to restore man back to sonship again, God didn't change the pattern because of the fall. He sent his son. It's always about sonship, always about God's plan, because God's plan and his eternal purpose is a family of sons in the image of Jesus Christ extending his kingdom. So when we look, we tend to think about the Bible in terms mostly about the salvation message, not realizing it's actually about the uh, manifestation of sons sharing in the governance of God's creation. And so our restoration is a restoration back to sonship and back to governance and serving our Father. I can't go into all of that now. I've got some stuff online and there's material, little material, some messages and some things I put out in terms of book form. I want to share on this, uh, this session on, remo on legal rights of access or doors of entry for demons. We'll call it doors of entry for demons. And uh, I had a Bible there a moment ago. Where is it? There it is there. Did Ian take it? Ian. <laughs> okay, I want you to have a look with me in Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 27. Ephesians 4, 27. It's talking about uh, walking in the Spirit and then makes this interesting statement in, in verse 27. And it's in the context of uh, how we conduct our lives leading up to the point where in, verse, in chapter 6 it talks about our warfare. But in Ephesians 4 and verse 27, uh, he, he's talking about how to walk in the Spirit. And uh, it says, <clears throat> putting away lying, let everyone speak truth with his neighbor, for we're members of one another. Be angry, but don't sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Neither give place to the devil. Let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good. They may have something to give him who has need. Now, there's a whole lot could be shared in this, but it's basically talking about how we live in the spirit. And it involves a transformation process. And right in the middle, he drops in, don't give a place to the devil. So he talks about how we conduct ourselves. So deliverance is an encounter where people are set free, but then there's got to be transformation that accompanies that. So, so, he's, so for example, he talks there about, uh, he says, let him that stole steal no more. Now, so when do you stop being a thief? It's not when you stop stealing. It's when you become a giver. So you see the transformation is, is not just stopping the sin. It's actually changing the way you think and live your life so you come into kingdom alignment. Okay? So let him that stole just stop stealing. But you see, there's it, more to it than that. You need to change the whole framework of the way you're viewing life out of poverty and need and envy of someone else's things and taking the easy path, you've got to rather put on a new mentality and a new lifestyle of working so you become a giver to those who are in need. So see the transformation there, putting off the old, renewed in your mind, putting on the new. And then right in the middle of all of this, he talks about don't give place to the devil. And the context there immediately preceding that is anger that anger opens a door for demons. So I'm going to pick up just that one verse there, give no place to the devil. Now he's writing to Christians. The word place is the word 
topos in Greek, meaning jurisdiction, a, a space of legal operation, a, uh, a doorway, a, an, a, a beachhead. That's the, that's the meaning of that word. So he's saying, don't give a legal ground for demons to have access to your life. That means it must be possible for us to do that. So a legal right is any activity that gives a demon permission to access your life and remain there. A legal right is an activity that gives demonic spirits a legal permission to go in there and act against people, to enter into them and afflict them. So when we sin ignorantly or deliberately and violate God's laws, we are creating legal rights. And the, the realm of the Spirit works like a court system. Remember we saw in 1 Peter 5 verse 8, your adversary, your opponent at law, your opponent at law. So the devil is an immense legalist. He knows that the, the physical works on natural laws, the spirit realm works on spiritual laws, and he uses those against us. So, for example, if you turn up in court, there is a judge, there is a prosecutor, and hopefully you've got an attorney to defend you. And so an accusation is made, and you need to have an answer to the accusation. And if you've broken the law, then the answer is, I broke the law. <laughs> and then, however, someone has paid the fine on my behalf. And we call on Jesus then who died on the cross for our sin, represent us and take the penalty. And for us then to have the verdict favorable to us, it's overturned. We're free. But you see, if there's no recognition of legal rights being violated of, of us breaking the laws of God, you can't break the laws of God without a consequence. God does not remove his law because he likes you. He also is a God who acts with justice. And so he's because of justice, he has to uphold the laws. So when the devil overcame uh, Adam and took away his authority, God didn't just take it back. He had in plan already how to get it back. Someone from Adam's line rose up and represented God and got the rights back for us as a man. So, so we see then legal rights then are any activity that opens a doorway that gives a right for demons to access. So uh, you notice there in Luke 4 and verse 6, it says, uh, The devil showed Jesus all the kingdoms of the world, and he said, All of these have been given to me. That word given was yielded or handed over or surrendered or betrayed to me. So he's saying, I have authority to operate because it was surrendered to me by a violation of the law of God. Now, once you understand kingdom, it's really easy. We just need to come into alignment. And that's the whole point, bring into alignment each time. And so when we come to ministering to people, one of the things that's incredibly helpful to do is to identify legal rights that would give demonic spirits access and begin by removing the legal rights. Then if there's no more legal rights, deliverance becomes a relatively straightforward process. And it's, it's not a hard thing to do. I'll share it to you. And uh, so, let's, so then let's just go a little further then. So... Uh, <clears throat> If you read in, uh, for example, John chapter 13 and verse 2, John chapter 13 and verse 2, you'll see an exact example of how a demon enters a person because it tells it this when it happened. Uh, you maybe not have seen it before, but here it is in John chapter 13 and verse 2. And now the feast of Passover, when Jesus knew his hour had come that he would depart from the world to his father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. Now here it is. And supper being ended... The devil, having already put it into the heart of Jesus, the Simon, uh, uh, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, and so on. So there it is. It said the devil put it into his heart. So notice it's already put into his heart. So all sin begins in the heart. There's always something happens inside us that gives demons access. So we're going to look at that. And so the devil entered uh, Satan. Uh, the devil entered uh, um, um, 
Judas, and uh, he way he went and did the sin. So, so there it is. It's amazing when you actually see it's at, at that point where he betrayed him. Amazing. Okay, so uh, very. Uh, let me see where I find the verse here. Anyway, just leave it. I'll move on. Okay, and I want to give you and identify with you then some of the legal rights or the grounds that, that devils use to get into people. Now, remember, because they're law-based, they're nothing to do with whether you're a nice person or not. It's got nothing to do with how kind you are, how, and, oh, you're such a nice person. You've got nothing to do with that. If you break the law, you break the law. You're a lawbreaker, and things happen. It's really simple as that. Or putting it another way, if I'm standing here on the edge of a cliff, and I'm ignorant of gravity or refuse to acknowledge gravity, it doesn't mean gravity isn't there and it doesn't mean there isn't a consequence. If I step off and fall down and break my legs, I can't go blaming gravity. I can't go blaming God. I've just actually violated a law. I prove the law is there because of the consequences. So God always works off personal responsibility and consequences. He is a just God. He works on principles. Once you see that, you get out of this sweet, lovey thing that God's just so kind and everything. Actually, God is also just and works off principles. And so you can't persuade him to do things off the fact you're crying. You're, he's persuaded when you appeal to his word. He's not going to move because you're in trouble. He will move because there's faith in his word. It's always that way. So we've got to become then very word-based as we move into this area of ministry. So let me give you some, uh, some ways that demonic spirits enter people. And some of these will be developed a bit further in detail, so I won't go into them so much as to give you the overview so you get the idea of how demons gain access. So when I'm working with people on a counseling mode or they've come for help, my, my first role is to discover what the fruit are and look for the roots because wherever there's a fruit, there'll be a root. So the first part of my role is to be forensic in looking at the fruit and trying to track back to the root. And the problem with sin, because sin deceives, is most people can't connect the problem they have to a sin or an action or a root further back in their life. And it's quite easy to identify. Once you know what to look for, then immediately as people talk and tell their story, you'll see exactly where things have happened that now are producing a fruit that becomes accumulative. So often when they come, they're in such a mess and so many problems, don't know what to do, torment, and, and they don't even know where to start. But when you start to look and process through where the doors of entry are, you can see, oh, I can see the picture now. So I'll, I'll share with you the process I use with people so you can kind of ha have an idea, one, one way of approaching it. Okay, here we go. So I always look for the, um, for the deepest area, and the, the deepest area are what you call generational curses and iniquity, generational curses and iniquity. So I'll explain what they are without developing them because I know that uh, Wes is going to do a session on that, and I don't want to take away his ministry. No, 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 just no, no. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, what is a generational curse? What is a curse, first of all? A curse is a cycle of defeat that's empowered by demons. A curse is a cycle of defeat and oppression that's empowered by demons. In other words, there's a force behind it, a spirit being behind it. That's why you can't seem to ever get over it. So Wes will share more on that. So a generational curse is a cycle of of oppression or failure that is generational. It keeps going from one generation to the other. And so the consequences of the sins of a previous generation are now being experienced by the next generation. And you're now born into this world with problems you never caused, but the consequences are yours because you're connected to this family. God designed initially that blessing would flow generationally. So there is a DNA connection. There's a spirit connection from generation to generation because God desires blessing to flow generationally. But once sin entered, now something else can flow there. In other words, the devil didn't create something new. He just found a way to use what God had put in place for blessing to destroy. So many of the battles you wrestle with didn't start with you. They started with a previous generation that violated God's laws and never addressed the problem. 
And now the next generation suffers because of it. And they have to, you must be the generation which arises and brings an end to it and initiates a cycle of blessing. So um, without me going too far into it, in Isaiah 61, if you follow through Isaiah 61, you will see a process in place, three distinct phases. You know, the, the way the passage goes, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me, he's anointed me to proclaim the gospel to the poor, heal, uh, heal the brokenhearted, proclaim deliverance to the captives, and so on. Okay, now, so that's the first part, ministry to be set free and reconnected to God. Okay, then the next part is that they may become trees of righteousness. So God starts with freeing us up from these things so we can become fruitful and an honor to him. And then you go down a further, and they shall be repairers of the desolation of many generations. So you see a progression where God selects you to enter into the healing and deliverance journey so you can become a fruit to him and bring honor to him and bring an end to the old cycle and start a new cycle of blessing. So, so then we must address issues which are generational that keep showing up from one generation to another because of the kinds of sins that have gone on prior to us. Usually it's about three or four generations out. And uh, that's a, it seems like that seems to be a prince. It seems to take three generations to establish something. And so about three generations, you've got to go back, it seems. Anyway, regardless of that, the Holy Ghost gives us uh, help with that. So generational curses and iniquity. I use the word iniquity. Iniquity refers to a twist in our life that twists us towards a certain kind of sin. Seems like our DNA was affected somehow. We have a tendency towards a certain kind of sin. So frequently the issues that people have began before them and they are, they are the victims of injustice against them. And so we must deal with this injustice and bring it to the cross. I'll show you the exact steps of doing it. It's not a hard thing to do. So it may well be that you're struggling with things like that. From my example, we had on both sides of my family background, there was adultery by grandfathers. And there was also Freemasonry, at least on one side. So that opens the door now for cycles of sexual sin in the family and for cycles of spiritual bondage and oppression and blindness to, the, uh, to uh, spiritual realities. So those are things I had to recognize and address and deal with. Not to blame the family, rather to recognize I'm connected to family, honor what was good and bring to the cross what was bad. That makes sense? Anyway, I, I've done enough on that. So, so that's a specific entry. I always look for that first of all and ask and try and establish where the problems began. So uh, I've been surprised how many, like I had someone I prayed for recently and um, they were experiencing demonic sexual attack. That means they were having, uh, they were being molested by a, she was being molested by a spirit at night. Now, that can only be a cult. And so when I inquired, there's nothing she'd done that had opened that door. Therefore, it was a family door. So now there's secrets in the family that no one's talking about, what they've been involved in. And so when we addressed that generational curse and broke the power of whatever sexual sin was in the family line, she was immediately set free from the tormenting spirits. So, so we do have to consider that the problems you're addressing may have started prior to the life of the child and being part of a family thing and other members of the family have the same problem. Okay, rightio, well, let's move on. I'm sure um, that uh, Pastor Wes will share with you some of the signs of curses as well. Okay, uh, a, a second area is the area I'll call a cult. A cult. And a cult covers, a cult means, the word occult means something hidden or secret, something covered or concealed. So the kingdom of God is a kingdom of light. Everything is visible. Kingdom of the, of the devil is a kingdom of darkness. Everything is unseen. In the kingdom of God, the person who gets the honor is Jesus Christ. The kingdom of the occult self is the center of it. In the kingdom of God, the Holy Spirit is the source of power. In the kingdom of the occult, the source of power is veiled. 
mysterious, cosmic energy, this or that, uh, and all sorts of names are given for it. But at the end, it's hidden spirit beings that are working. If there's supernatural power, there is a being producing it. So you, that's how you track things down. So uh, when we look at a, uh, we'll just look at uh, briefly in Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18. And you can see it in there. And uh, <clears throat> Deuteronomy 18 and, uh, and verse 9. And uh, God is speaking to the people of Israel coming into the land of Canaan. Now, most of us struggle with the injustices, it seems to be, of genocide and whatever, not realizing what was going on in Canaan. And it had been going on for hundreds of years, and they refused to repent and to change. They were involved in the worship of idols, the worship of wicked spirits. And their worship involved child sacrifice. It involved temple prostitution. It involved male and female prostitution. It was a horrendous bondage to demonic powers, and they refused to repent, so judgment came upon them. God warns his people going into the land in verse, uh, uh, verse 9, when you come into the land the Lord your God is giving you, do not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes a son or daughter pass through the fire. Uh, that's uh, op op offerings to Molech of the child, uh, which is the modern-day equivalent the modern equivalent would be abortion. It's the same spirit behind it. The offering of a child to a God in order for protection or provision or power of some kind. So uh, I'm not making judgments about people and why they do things, but the spirit behind it is a destroyer of infants. And we see that each time God was about to move, there was an increase in the Spirit's activities, firstly in Exodus and Moses, then secondly when Jesus came and in the end times there'll be a massive increase again, which is what we're seeing. It's generations having their destinies stolen from them. And you don't know whether in those generations that were to be born, God had deliverers. They're not always born into the best situations, but they are born with a destiny, which we see in Jephthah in Judges 11, who was the child of a prostitute through adultery, half Ammonite and half Hebrew, but God raised him to be the head and the deliverer for the nation. Anyway, no, we won't go sidetracking here. So, we're not, so there it is, uh, pass through the fire, practices witchcraft, a soothsayer, one who interprets omens, sorcerer, one who conjures spells, medium, spiritist, one who calls up the dead. All who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of these abominations, the Lord your God drives them out from before you. For this nation, verse 14, which you will dispossess, listen to the soothsayers and diviners. As for you, the Lord your God has not appointed you to such. So God is very clear in his directives, do not engage in these practices and do not become defiled by bringing any of their idols or objects into your home. He's very clear about that because they all give direct access to the demonic realm. So, so when we talk about the occult, we're talking about a number of things. Number one would be idolatry. Idolatry, the worship of idols, active worship of idols. 1 Corinthians 10, 14 tells us that a person worshiping an idol, we're to flee idolatry in verse 20 to 22, because when you get involved in idolatry, you are participating or fellowshipping with a demon. Now, of course, we look, hey, we're not idol worshippers. You'd be amazed what goes on. And our culture is experiencing an increase of people from uh, honor shame cultures which do worship idols. And so we're finding an increase of this in our nation. They understand the idol itself is nothing. It's the spirit being that gets into it because it was dedicated to a demon. Yeah. And so when people make an offering, they are now at an altar. They've built an altar. And the offering, the bowing, the offering incense, offering rice, offering fruit, offering something, even up to offering a child, all of that is a spiritual transaction. It's called trading. Yeah. Trading with a demon in return for something. Protection, provision, or power. Those are the three things. Now understand, the devil got that idea from God. He just put it into his own form. And so... It's an altar built that offers to... So people do that. And of course, they get involved with demons. They get involved with the gods they worship. They become like. And so we have to deal with the, this kind of stuff everywhere that we go. Uh, <clears throat> in the West, 
Of course, idols are not so direct, but associated with idol, idolatry is false religion. Now, false religion rooted in error can open the door for demons as well. And so when there are things, and particularly churches start off often in a move of God and go into either doctrinal or spiritual area, legalism, and then spiritual bondage takes place as a result of that. So I've had to pray for people coming out of churches who came out demonized because of how they were treated in the church or because of the church's posture or positioning towards the Holy Spirit. Now, so for example, I had one man come to me and he um, had been hungry for the Holy Ghost, wanted to get the Holy Ghost. He drove four hours to meet me. I thought, okay, I'll see him. And so I sat down with him to hear his story and he was hungry for God and he'd driven four hours to get filled with the Holy Ghost. And I said, well, have people prayed for you? Yeah, people have prayed for me. And I said, uh, what happened? He said, nothing. And I said, tell me, do you belong to this particular fundamental uh, denomination uh, which teaches against the Holy Spirit and also is against the gifts of the Spirit and spoken against the gift of tongue, speaking of tongue? You know, yes. I said, did you get exposed to that teaching? She, he said, yes. Then I said, you have come into agreement with the doctrine of demons and it has now brought a spirit of unbelief over your life. That's why you can't receive. So I said, so before I pray for you to get filled with the Holy Ghost and experience failure like everyone else has done, we will remove the blockage. So here's what you do. I want you to come to the Lord and renounce your agreement with the false doctrine, the Antichrist spirit behind it, and the spirit of unbelief behind it as well, and ask the Lord to set you free. So he did that simple prayer just like that. And then I laid hands, prayed and broke those agreements. Then I showed him how to receive, led him and he just immediately got filled with the Holy Ghost. His life was transformed, wow. become an on fire, wow. passionate for God. In fact, his whole destiny was on halt because of bondage to religious spirits. Wow. Oh, whoa. So we could share a lot around that. I've given you enough to get you going. Okay, so, so for um, some cultures, of course, they're involved in uh, ancestral worship and spiritism and welcoming spirits of previous generations is a fine line before it moves over to getting involved with demons. Uh, spiritism, as we see in Deuteronomy 18, is very common and particularly among this generation who are hungry for spiritual experience. So uh, basically the main uh, branches of spiritism are uh, divination, fortune telling. So in uh, Acts 16 and verse 16, as Paul went to prayer, a woman demonized with a spirit of python or spirit of divination met with them saying, these are the servants of the Most High God. And so this was a demonic encounter with the spirit, which was a territorial spirit. And so Paul became ag aggravated and agitated because of the activity of the spirit manifesting through the woman eventually turned and commanded the Spirit to come out and she got delivered. And then, of course, everyone reacted. There was a massive outbreak in the city and they got thrown into jail and all that kind of stuff. So it wasn't the demon, did it? It's just the stirring of the bondage. They, they came and confronted something in the city. Now, divination is on the rise everywhere. People want to know the future, want to know what's going to be. And they look to the spirit realm for that information. Divination is obtaining information from the spirit world. It's a substitute for prophecy. The other one is sorcery. And so sorcery uh, is found in uh, Acts 19, uh, verse 19. There was a sorcery there and magic. People are involved in magic. And uh, so sorcery is very common. Sorcery is obtaining power from the spirit realm to manipulate people and circumstances. So these are the most common occult practices. So there's, every culture's got their own forms of it, calling up the dead, uh, you know, seances, um, you know, divination, water divining. It goes on and on and on. There's always things. But if there's any kind of power behind it and it's unknown, then it's probably occultic in nature. So we just need to be aware of those things. Um, uh, one of the areas that I have found uh, that opens the door significantly to people now is the realm of media and games, uh, particularly fantasy role playing and particularly if it's involved with the occult in any way. And uh, when they take on the role, Jesus said this, he said, if you look at a woman w and with lust in your heart, you have committed adultery in your heart. So you notice the, the, the imagination coupled with desire conceives sin and gives then a legal right for a demon to be there. So lusting after a woman will open the door for a spirit of lust to enter. 
Now, in the same way, when people go into visual media longing for power, longing for identity, longing to, to, to conquer and gain power, their heart yearning for power, coupled with their imagination, opens the door to be demonized through the games and then they become addictive and many problems come. And I've, I've prayed for hundreds of people to be set free of these addiction to these uh, games which are either very violent or uh, very involved in uh, casting spells. So it's not the initial, the initial engagement with it that demonizes people, it's the giving yourself over to it. And so I was in a Bible school and we had over 200 students come up in Old Hall for that massive deliverance. They were all addicted to this game, World of Warcraft, which formerly was called Dungeons and Demi Gods. And it's all about taking on a role player being a sorcerer. And the many of those games now, and people, uh, it's, it's why you've got to watch what people are engaging in because they can engage with this kind of stuff. So if people uh, have been involved with the occult in any way, then they will have paranormal experiences. They'll have noises happening. They'll hear voices, uh, maybe objects moving. They may have nightmares. They may wake up and they, someone like, feels like someone's choking them and they can't work out what's causing it. That's all occult. That's a doorway has been opened to the spirit realm that has to be closed. Demons will hold on to that and they will not go until that door's closed. So you have to remove the legal right. Once someone's engaged in the occult, it's very difficult to free them unless the legal rights are removed. They just, those demons will claim. I've even had them saying, she belongs to me. He belongs to me. And then how come? Well, he was dedicated to me. So some, ch some parents dedicate their children to idols. Later on then, they've got the demon of that idol in their life. Uh, so, so we need to be just aware of those things. Um, sometimes uh, people are demonized by, uh, they're affected strongly by spirits that molest them at night. That's a spirit, it's, it's sometimes called a spirit husband or it's called incubus spirit. But basically the spirit manifests and holds the person onto the bed and then sexually molests them. So they feel all the sensations of a sexual abuse, but there's no one there. And the defilement is enormous and the trauma is enormous. And then the silence is enormous because people don't know where to go to talk to anyone about what's happening to them. And yet it's an, I found it widespread, quite far more widespread than you realize. And when people get delivered, they just, they're so, they, they, everything changes because they have this dreadful secret. And uh, I've been surprised how many people come into church and hide this stuff probably because they're so ashamed of it, and fear no one will believe them. And so unless you come into a Holy Ghost church where people understand it. So I had someone the other day, and she, she struggles so much to talk about it. When she said, I said, oh, no, this is what that is. It's the spirit. And this is how it's come. I said, there's nothing you've done. This has been in your family. Someone in your family has been involved with spiritism, witchcraft, I'd imagine, in your family line. And, yeah, oh, and my fun, uncle was a witch doctor. And so <laughs> there it all is, just like that. Just opened up just like that. Then I said, and she went home and then looked it up online and found a picture. She said, oh, that's the very picture of the demon that I saw. Wow. Exactly the one. And so anyway, so th these are things you need to be aware of, that there's a, a gr much greater, uh, it seems to me, activity in this dimension. And so if people are having paranormal experiences, don't minimize it and don't laugh at it. It's probably very real and they need deliverance and setting free. And there will be either activities they've done to open the door, gone to a seance, called up a spirit. We even had one pastor's son, and we were talking, and he said, oh, we were just preparing for deliverance. He said, oh, I remember one time I cut myself and invited the devil to take over my life. Would that count? And, and his father was just shocked. I said, you've, had, you've formed a blood covenant. So tattoos can be a form of blood covenant. So... I'm not anti, it's just there are many problems. I've had people that the moment we prayed to break the spirit of slavery and bondage over their life around the tattoo, there was immediate manifestation. I, I don't share stories around that, but don't get, if you got one, then maybe you just need prayer to just deal with whatever came up, whatever's the root of it. I, I'll give you, I had one example, one girl came to me and I know she had a tattoo. She said, oh, what's all that? She said, oh, and she said, oh, that's, uh, uh, it's to remind me of my grandfather. I said, oh, you're very close to him. Yeah, very close to him. And I said to her, I said, do you realize that tattoos historically and all the way through the Bible were an emblem of slavery? No. I said, that doesn't remind you of your grandfather. It reminds you of your loss. You are anchored to death and a spirit of grief. 
and you can't get over it. And she just looked shocked. And uh, she, oh, no, no. And I said, well, then are you willing to then pray a prayer to let go of your grandfather to the Lord so you can move on with that? No, I won't do that. I said, see, you're in bondage to a spirit. Wow, exactly. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> okay. We keep on, should we keep on going? I'll give us some more doorways. I'll give you all the doorways. I, w- I won't share so much on all of them. Uh, I'm going to teach a little bit more on the, uh, on the um, sexual sin uh, on another session. But sexual sin opens the door for demonic spirits as well. Because of the law, the two become one. So when you become involved in a sexual relationship with someone, then two become one. So spiritually, uh, there is a contract that brings you together. So you become one with the person. You say, well, I left them years ago. Yeah, yeah, but actually, you've caused a law to be put in place, making you one with that person. So now there's a soul tie. There's a bonding between the two of you that allows demons to enter your life and torment you. So it'll bring problems in your personal life. It'll bring problems in your intimacy and your marriage. You won't be able to get over the pictures, images, and, and various history you've had. It'll still torment you. Anyway, we'll talk about that in other sessions. So, so, uh, so that's another a major doorway for people to, to get into problems. Another doorway, uh, habit, habit patterns of sin. Habit patterns of sin. There are sins which not initially open the door for demons, but over time, as they become a habit in your life or a pattern in your life, can definitely open the door for demonic defilement. And I'll just list them. They're pretty well obvious. Uh, 1 John 3.15, hatred. Hatred. Hatred is equivalent to murder. In other words, hatred in the heart is what produces the act of murder. So hatred in the heart is op- opens the door for demons. And uh, here's the thing. You don't always feel hatred. So I, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but hatred can be hostility. Everyone would recognize that. Hatred can be the withholding of love from you. You can read it up and look at the definitions of it. To hate someone means to act in a hostile way to them or withhold what they need. So many people have come up in families where what was needed for their health and emotionally and relationally and spiritually was withheld and they have come into an agreement of hating themselves. And that does not produce life. It produces struggles to receive from God. So hatred is, a, is an issue. Uh, unforgiveness, unforgiveness, which we'll talk about tonight. Matthew 18, 35. Bitterness, Hebrew 12, 15, bitterness. Bitterness comes from unforgiveness. It's the consequence of un- unforgiveness. But bitterness will open the doorway for defilement by demons in a significant way that affects and poisons all relationships. So bitterness is uh, one of the important issues. I'll touch on that a bit tonight as well. Ephesians 4.26, anger, be angry, but sin not, neither let the sun go down on your anger. So uh, it says it's okay to have feelings of anger at injustice. That's normal. However, you should make sure you don't explode with anger and destroy people by your angry uh, abuse, nor internalize your anger so that you actually destroy yourself nor should you go to bed without resolving it. So it says you've got, tw- you got a day to resolve it, <laughs> deal with it. And uh, so, so it advises it, and then it says, and, and the devil is waiting for access. So you don't deal with anger. Pretty soon you'll find you've got demonic problems around your life. First one, then another, then another. And so, so it goes on. Here's another, uh, so oh, I'll get some more, uh, rebellion. Uh, Proverbs 27, 11, the person who rebels, a cruel messenger will be sent against him. So rebellion is the root of witchcraft. So witchcraft or occult activity springs out of unresolved bitterness and rebellion in the heart. They go hand in hand. You find bitterness and rebellion, you'll find then witchcraft. So Simon the sorcerer, Peter discerned, he had bitterness in his heart. That's why he's wanting power. His power wasn't for uh, enhancing the kingdom of God. His power was to use it for himself to grow and and, and, and gain his ministry, so on. Um, Fantasy is another doorway for demons to enter. Fantasy. 
These are patterns of uh, fantasizing, going away into an escape world, Matthew 6, 22. Uh, fantasy or forming images in the mind and then living in another unreal world. And so men and women can do this. You can evolve in fantasy. Fantasy images, uh, we'll touch on the area of pornography a little bit later, but it can be just escaping, going into dramas, going in and get addicted to something on there, but you're living your life through it rather than actually just a bit of casual entertainment. So we've got to guard that we don't draw off into fantasy as a way of escaping the pain that we're not willing to face in life. Okay, lying is Isaiah 28, 15. When we continually lie, then uh, we come into a covenant with the spirit of death and hell. It says very clearly in Isaiah 28, it says uh, we have made a covenant with death and with hell we're in agreement because with lies, we've made lies our refuge. Okay? So when you, Isaiah 28, verse 14, 15, sorry. And I discovered that quite a while back. So when, what that means, you see, death and hell, what does that mean? Death and hell are spiritual powers. So the power of death works with other spirits. But actually, here's the impact of it. When a person is dead, they don't feel anything. And they, they're unresponsive, see? They're, 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 alone, they're separated. So when the spirit of death starts to grip people, then there's a numbness in their emotions that they don't feel stuff. And there's a sense of constant separation and isolation. They can't build relationships. And you'll find with sexual sin, the Bible says, it leads down to death and hell. Now, it's, not, it's more than just that's a place you'll end up. It also means a realm of torment now. So death is isolation and numbness, not feeling anything. And many people, they, they've lost contact with their heart. They don't feel in their heart what they should be feeling because there's damage done to their heart and they've never resolved it. There's a spirit around it shutting them down and there's wounds in there to be dealt with. Uh, the spirit of hell or the power of hell is a tormenting power. Hell is a place of torment. So when death and hell have got grip on people, they live separated, they live disconnected, they're not really feeling things and they're tormented. So you think about a person who's lying all the time, they can't build close relationships. They're numb to what they're doing and the effect it has on people. They're numb. They're ignorant of the fact that when you lie to someone, you hate them. You're ex lying is an expression of hatred. Right. And uh, it tells us in Proverbs. And, and they can't realize that actually they live in fear. They'll be caught out all the time. There's no peace in any of them. No kingdom life in that. Okay? So, 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 so these are just keys. These are just things I've, that I found from experience. So, and then, of course, addictions. Addictions are substitutes. Uh, for dealing with issues. Addiction is where a person uh, looks to something to comfort their pain and then they become dependent on it, becomes an idol in their life. And so all kinds of addictions, pornography, uh, fantasy, can be sports, can be the work, can be hey, every, every kind of thing, drugs, alcohol, hey, you name it, there's something there. Can even be serving. Can even be serving. And people are using serving as a way of not facing their pain, of trying to obtain value and significance or even power in the church, but not dealing with their pain. So I found a problem that we have seen emerge is when people have been traumatized or wounded, if they've never resolved it, they come into agreement with the Jezebelical control power and now they'll serve and do everything to eliminate everyone else and become absolutely indispensable in the church. And you've got no idea that actually you've got sitting right next to you a demonic power that's trying to shut down and squeeze the life out of everything and everyone. You know, that's another whole area of its own. Okay, <laughs> we won't go there this time round. That's another area. So ungodly soul ties, or I call them ungodly attachments. Ungodly attachments are another doorway for demons. So some people call them soul ties, but actually they are, they are spiritual bonds that are unlawful or illegal, and they allow demons to access your life. And uh, the attachments are formed usually when there's a powerful emotional experience between two people. But because they're spiritual in nature, they keep the door open for demons. Now, there's a whole heap of these. Now, I'll just throw a few things out. So, so, so these attachments can be godly, and they produce life, or ungodly, and they produce another problem. 
And so you find all kinds of attachments. And it starts off godly and then ends up in a mess. So some of these things can be generational. Some can be sexual. When you, when you involve sexually with someone, there's a bond or an attachment form that needs to be broken. And uh, it can be from idolatry. If we're involved in idolatry, there can be, again, this attachment to the idol that needs to be broken. Uh, people can be attached to dead people. In other words, they got stuck in their grief, never stopped grieving, never willing to let go because this was their comfort and source of life. And when you when, to be, have a soul tied to a dead person actually puts you in attachment to a spirit of grief. And so you can never, ever get over and move on with your life. You just never have resolved it. And as I say, with that, with that young girl, when I said, are you willing to let go of your grandfather and move on? She didn't want to let go. I said, that tells you then you've got an attachment that's ungodly and unhealthy. God wants us to enjoy the contribution of people, but recognize when it's time to let go and maintain our attachment to him as our source. So these are uh, uh, distinct doorways to demons. Uh, people can be uh, in soul ties where there have been promises or secrets. Now you mustn't tell them. You must. I want you to promise you not tell your mother. Now that can bring those promises like that. You know, or, uh, promise me. And I'll share this. With you. Promise me you won't tell the pastor. No, I won't promise that. Yeah, come on. Because if I promise to do that, I'm breaching my role or chain of command I'm responsible and accountable to him so if I feel he needs to hear it I'll share it so it's up to you whether you trust me with this otherwise you get attached to a terrible secret and now you're in torment because your your chain of command your your line of alignment has been breached oh <laughs> I see you thinking about these you know what happens constantly people can be people can have attachments to animals my goodness, it's unbelievable. It can be demonic. It can be demonic. I had, I want, I'll just be careful so I don't reveal who it might be, but I had a person I know who's involved in a pastoral role and their husband uh, was very attached to this dog. And so when the husband died um, and the dog would just constantly be needy all the time, was around, always dependent and dependent and holding onto the, and he, would, he could hardly ever go anywhere without the dog. Anyway, he made her promise before he died that she'd not have the dog put down. I knew about the situation. I said, get the dog put down. It's not going to go well. And uh, anyway, so anyway, he, had the, he died. She didn't put the dog down. Now, the dog then began to now depend on her. And so she would have, the first thing I was aware of, she said, I've got to head back from church. I said, why do you have to head back from church so soon? Oh, it's the dog. I said, wait a minute. I said, the dog does it's, The dog doesn't, doesn't matter. You stay here and help people and serve people. And I've got to get home to the dog. And then when she'd get home to the dog, the dog would kind of hurry her off into the bedroom and then hop up on the bed beside her to hug. And I'm thinking, that's, I said, that's demonic. That's a familiar spirit. You need to get the, get the devil out of it or get the dog down, whatever. <laughs> get the devil out of it. Anyway, these are some things. So, of course, people can be soul tied to objects. They have a fetish for something. They can be soul tied to, to controlling people. That's one of the big ones. When someone is a controlling person, then they establish their control by your yielding, and then you can get attached and can't get away, which is what happens in many abusive marriages. People get soul tied to trauma. Trauma is one of the big areas that people get attached to. People can be soul tied to familiar spirits, and they've got a familiar spirit, and they won't let it go because it's become their friend. And very real. So I've had that. Okay, so there's another one. Uh, word curses are another doorway for demons. Word curses. So uh, word curses are a doorway for demons. Word curses are words spoken uh, which invoke something negative in your life. And so if they're spoken by authority people or people with high value in your life, they cause a problem. They unleash demons in the earth. Because as God's representatives, we're given power to speak to, and to bring things into being. So when people speak bad words, and I found in some cultures, frankly, they, the parents are incredibly abusive of the kids, and the kids are all abusive of one another. They are literally cursing one another. You're dumb. You're stupid. Hey, whatever it is. You know, they're saying all these things. Listen, that stuff is unleashing curses. The person who receives it, if they come to agreement with it, will then take up the resonance, oh, I'm dumb. I can't do anything. And so now they're living under a demonic spirit. They're in agreement with a lie, which was initiated by, by being cursed with words. We had to learn a word to bless people with our words. So, uh, so people can curse themselves. 
with death wishes. I just want to die, I want to die, I got out it too much. All of that kind of stuff invokes spirits on your life. So it's just being aware of these things. Trauma experiences are another doorway, major doorway. Traumas in the womb, traumas pre-birth or at birth, traumas in young childhood, traumas uh, uh, during growing up. And they can be a whole variety of uh, different forms of trauma. It's a whole area of its own. But basically, when someone has a trauma, they have an experience that overwhelms their emotions and, and ability to process it. They are overwhelmed. So the, the trauma then is dispersed into the body. So it doesn't go away. It goes into the body cells and is remembered in all the body cells. The nervous system is triggered onto high alert and won't go off. So sleep patterns are disturbed, and if it's a severe one, it can affect the neural pathways and bring imprints and pictures into the brain that affects the ability to use their imagination and, and affects the thinking process as well. So traumas are a significant issue. Not only that, it opens the doorway for demons, spirits of trauma, spirits of shock, fear, and also spirits of infirmity which stop the person healing. So frequently you'll find when someone's had a trauma, they can't just get over it. They need the demons cast out, the soul ties to the trauma broken, and they need their body to be released from the various aspects of the trauma that have affected it. And quite remarkable the things that can happen. Okay, so, so the, and then I'll put the last one down as just transference. Transference. So people can uh, be demonized just by exposure to certain things. Now, I don't go away and worry about what I'm going to... I just stay aligned with God and full of the Holy Ghost. I'm not going to pick stuff up easily. It won't come near me. You know, that's the way you, you walk in freedom. But, but you can become vulnerable. Movies and media can be open doors for demons. And, and you find that people can become addicted to it. And then before you know it, they're defiled by demons. You've got to watch those areas that if anything that's sort of just getting a bit out of hand, uh, fantasy games, uh, defilement by touching dead bodies. I've had people forced to kiss someone who was dead. Next thing you know, they're now struggling and they've got all kinds of death wishes and, and suicidal things. I don't know where it's all come from, but you track it back. It happened at that point. And uh, so, again, it's just a matter of being careful. I found people that have gone into temples. Um, they've often been defiled by that. Occult objects can defile you and demonize you. And, uh, and sometimes just the laying on of hands by someone who's got a demon. So you want to be careful about who lays hands on you, that they're recognized and, and that you only receive what God has for me. Everything else drops away in Jesus' name. So let's not be naive that through the laying on of hands, there is impartation. If someone is in agreement with a familiar spirit, it can have a massive effect on you. Now, I discovered that because I had a, girl, a lady in my church, when I was a very young believer, didn't know anything. And she came in, I wanted, she wanted prayer. I said, why? She said, I feel like a, a, a suicide, like I want to die. I said, well, how long has it been? And she wouldn't tell me. She said, oh, about three days. I said, well, how did that happen? She's very reluctant to help. But this is what happened, was a woman in the church had told her something and sworn her to secrecy. And from that point on, she felt disconnected, dead, and then wanting to die. So I prayed for God to deliver, didn't think much more of it, until about a week later, she came back for the same thing. I said, wait a minute, that's the second time for the same thing. What's happened? It was the same woman. I said, oh, that's a familiar spirit. I'm going to go confront her. And so we prayed. I, I prayed for quite a while. I went and confronted the lady with her husband. I had brought someone with me. And she went in and out of denial. I managed to find out that someone, when she was younger, laid hands on her, and that's when she felt the spirit came, but she didn't want to let it go. I said, you will let it go. You've actually brought curses on people in our congregation. You've defiled them with demons. I will not let this go unanswered. I will bring it out to the public unless you repent of it and go through deliverance prayer. And uh, so anyway, she didn't. And man, did we have a spiritual warfare. Man, that demon came into my home and we had massive warfare over the thing. In the end, I just brought it to the church. So straight away, they up and leave the area. Next thing I know, they're being set in as pastors of some kind of one of the Pentecostal church streams. I'm thinking, my God, is there no discernment here? No one asked where they came from or how they suddenly turned up able to do ministry, you know. Anyway, so those are some of the areas of doorways of demons. Now, if we're going to set people free, we need to then break the, remove the legal rights and heal the wounds and trauma. So essentially, the major doorways for demons are twofold. Some say three, some say four. Look, put it just simply like this. Legal rights, because there's been sin somewhere. Wounds and trauma, 
with the associated reactions, which are often legal rights. So just basically legal rights and then wounds and trauma. So when you're dealing with people, you want to remove legal rights so they can be set free. You want to heal the wounds and deal with the trauma also so they can be set free. So legal rights are direct opportunity for demons to enter, wounds and trauma, an indirect opportunistic thing from demons. And they just seize the moment to come in and infect the wound and then make it worse and then it becomes a big problem. So that gives you now some, what are the legal rights? And legal rights, we remove the legal rights and where people are wounded, we must bring healing to the wounds and closure to the doors of entrance that have been opened up. Sometimes it's not the wound itself, it's how the person reacted and what they did in reaction to what happened to them. Anyway, that gives you an idea what to do. In the next session we look at, we're going to start to look at then how do you remove legal rights, what is the process, and then how do you actually go through the ministry uh, dealing with someone who's come and they've got a problem, where do I start? Okay, there we go.